Where's the right? Okay. <laughs> okay, keep us fans. <laughs> We're rolling. Welcome to our very last day of the semester of studying the Hero's Journey by Joseph Campbell. I wish I had time to just say everything in a nutshell because I think it's been a really powerful semester for me anyway, I hope for some of you. Um, but coming to the end of it, we sort of have to come back to the very beginning where we were talking about we were all heroes and heroines of our story and that Joseph kind of mapped out by going through all these different cultures and time periods and all this different mythology to find what this universal story was, which is why it sort of resonates with all of us because it's, it's within all of us to, to, um, to, to see ourselves as the, the director of our own life, the hero, heroine of our own life. So when Joseph mapped that out, he had a very specific diagram that was in a circular sort of diagram, and it started with what? There is a separation. So something happens. Either you get the call or the universe like blows something up and you have this separation, change, challenge, how it, how it presents itself. And then we move into this period of initiation which is uh, so many great stories of our heroes and heroines or our own mythology um, about how we go through this period of, of, of you know sometimes struggle or figuring something out or in the forest and we're on this journey you know but then today is the end of it so we're going to come to the very last part of this whole idea of there's a separation we go through initiation and then how do we wind up return so, so what is what is a return? Bringing gifts back. Yeah. So, bringing gifts back could be for yourself, like in the story of um, the Wizard of Oz, the classic story we all know. She comes back, and the gifts are really for her. She's she's a different person than the one that left. Alice in Wonderland. She's like, I'm not the same person I was. It doesn't make any sense to go back there. You know, we come back with this experience. We come back. Um, being stronger or have grown. So that's a big part of return is what you return with. And we can see in our own lives all these like little um, diet, you know, all these times that we've gone through these little returns or big returns and, and what we brought back to our life and who we are because of it. But there's another component to return that I think is part of our human makeup. And that is that we give back to the community. And I was using an example of one of our very own students who's not here today, but um, we have a student, Kelly, who's been with me now, studying Ashtanga with me for 20 years. And when she first came to me, she was, um, she'd had her heart transplant. Uh, she had a, 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 a virus, um, was very unexpected, and she fortunately had a successful heart transplant. And Kelly really felt like that her ashtanga was one of the ways that she kept herself strong and healthy and managed all the meds that she had to be on to sustain her heart. And um, one of the beautiful things about Kelly is once she had her heart and she was healthy and successful, the first thing she wanted to do is give back. And so she was a rock climber. And so her and her husband wound up rock climbing all over the world to raise awareness for organ donations. and and got thousands of people over the years to donate organs um, for the cause. So that's one just beautiful example of return, you know, that you come back and you, you also give back to the community. Um, I was talking about Viktor Frankl, of course, and how he gave back through his logotherapy and he gave back to the people within the concentration camp with him. And then uh, last week's example, of course, was Nelson Mandela. And um, last week I read to you a, a poem that really sustained him. It was one of the major things that sustained him during his imprisonment. And the poem Invictus means unconquerable soul. But I want to back up a little bit and talk about the man who wrote the poem. So who wrote the poem? William Ernest Henley. By the way, I don't know why last week I said James. Just, it's William Ernest Henley. And he was a poet, a British poet, in the 1800s. And he wrote that poem in 1875 when he was in the hospital struggling with tuberculosis, really struggling with his life, struggling to survive. And that is when he wrote a number of poems, Invictus being one of them. Uh, one of the websites I was looking on to just uh, learn a little bit more about, um, Ernest Henley said that he, um, developed his artistic motif of poet as a patient. 
So it was at that time when he was in the hospital and fighting for his life that he really grew in his creativity and his expression through words, through poetry. And what's beautiful to me is that that is what helped sustain him to survive and to fight for his life and gave him hope. This poem, Invictus, you know, one of the lines is, I thank the gods that be for uh, my unconquerable soul. You know, uh, we, we're all familiar with the last two lines. I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. Like he's, he had this hope. He had this strength. So a hundred years later, there is a man in South Africa who's incarcerated in prison and he's reading this poem and this poem sustains him and and we've heard the story of Nelson Mandela that when things were hard and he couldn't bear it he would recite this poem and it would give him hope and it would give him strength so when you think of how beautiful that is one man's return on a completely different in a completely different country in a completely different time period becomes another man's hope and strength and his return that he brought to the other people that were in prison, he brought to the guards, he brought to the country, he brought to a planet. You know, it was his return that he gave all of us. Um, I love the story, uh, and it's on our website if you'll um, check it out. It's on the homepage, thanks to Sophia. A beautiful interview with Morgan Freeman because he played his he played Nelson Mandela in the beautiful movie Invictus, if you haven't seen it. I absolutely love it. And in that interview, he says that he was able to really spend three years with Nelson Mandela to really learn his character and learn the man that he is. And he talked about what a beautiful, quiet man he was. And when he walked into a room, he did not demand the room, but the room gave himself. They gave, they gave themselves to Nelson as his way of leadership. And he said, this really happened in prison. And it, it happened like this. And I love this story. I'll get choked up. They did a lot of things to the prisoners. Um, but one of the things they did is they tried to humiliate them. And so instead of giving them prison, they took away their prison uh, uniforms and instead gave them children's shorts and made them wear the children's shorts that didn't fit them. And there was only one man who was an Indian man who was given longer shorts or had longer shorts. And he said to Nelson Mandela, Amadeva, you, you take my shorts. And he said, no, they will call me Mr. And I will have long shorts. And he said that not like, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to teach them to respect me. I'm going to, he said it like, no, this is how it's going to be. And, and then uh, he said in the interview, this is how he did it. He said he knew one of the guard's son was very, very ill. And that guard came to work late or whatever that day. And Nelson called him over to him. And he said to him, how is your son? And that is how he earned their respect and their friendship. And how he changed the moments that he was incarcerated. You know what? I love thinking about the fact that Nelson Mandela did not have any idea that he would be the president of South Africa and that he would be able to implement the change that he did. All he knew is that he was waking up an imprisoned man. And I love that he chose love, that he chose compassion, he chose kindness in the moments of his life. So fast forwarding now to lightning bugs. Sean, in his new book, Sean Aker, Big Potential, starts this book off with a story about lightning bugs. Are you all very interested for me to tell you about lightning bugs? <laughs> so there was a scientist, an American scientist, in 1935 that went all the way to Southeast Asia jungles to do some research. His name was Hugh Smith. And while he was in the jungles to do his research, he went out at night in these mangrove forests with all the slimy snakes and nocturnal animals that were out and he was just observing when all of a sudden one of the mangrove trees lit up like lightning had struck it. The entire tree lit up and then went dark. And he was like shocked. He didn't know what he'd seen. He's like, it wasn't smoking. He didn't see any lightning. And then a few seconds later, it happened again. The whole mangrove tree lit up and then went dark. A few seconds later, a thousand feet of mangrove trees 
all lit up at the same time and then went dark. And he didn't know at the time what was happening. He was just like, it seemed magical to him that he's a scientist, so then he figured it out. It, were, it was these lightning bugs. And they were, would you know why do lightning bugs light up in the first place? Yes, so the male lightning bug lights up to attract their perfect partner. So they're like, whoa, whoa, hey, look at me, I'm so handsome, come get me, right? So that's what the lightning bug does. So he didn't realize at first, like what was, when he realized what it was, he went and researched and studied this, and he realized what was happening is these lightning bugs were all lightning bugging lightning together. So he wrote in this very prestigious science journal about what had happened, this phenomena, and of course no one believed him. It took him three years and other scientists to help prove what had happened. What had happened is this. One lightning bug in the mangrove forest, this is just like evolution, like survival, right? One lightning bug going like, rrr, rrr, check me out, check me out, has a 3% chance of finding their perfect loving mate. 3% chance. And this big dark forest, just one little light going off. If, in fact, they attract each other, which is really cool if you look at the science, it, they can't see each other. They can't like send out like little noises like, boop, boop, it's time to get our mates. It's this, <laughs> it's this node thing that they do. It's like, if you think of it like for us, like it's this vibration almost, this energy that pulls them all in and that they know exactly when, because of that node, to shine together. There's not random lights. They all do their light thing at the same time and stop and do it at the same time. So if you attract all these other male dudes to come and do this with you at the same time, guess what your chance is to find your very perfect mate? 87%. So you go from 3% to 87% if you're all like doing your lightning bug thing together. So Nelson Mandela was a lightning bug. He was, I always said last week, both Viktor Frankl for me and Nelson Mandela were outliers. They are the ones we should study. How can we be healthy? How can we be happy? How can we make a difference in the world? And, and so they, their return became this light that attracted others and has become this light in the world because of it. And it brings me to this happy anniversary. It is the anniversary of Pacific Ashtanga Yoga Shala. We have been opening our doors for 13 years. We're in our 14th year right now, and I feel very honored to say to you that I feel like the lightning bug. I feel like the lightning bug. It's like, like, hey, Sean Aker, hey, let's do these poses. Let's breathe. Let's, let's breathe and hold our breath. Let's, you know. And I'm, I'm for 13 years. I've been actually more. I've been teaching here in Orange County for over 20 years. But I've been going like, and I attracted all these great bugs. <laughs> All of you, it's like you responded to the call, right? And you're like, we're here in our mangrove tree, we call the Zivikastanga Yoga Shala, right? And even on our YouTube channel, we've like attracted you and the light has been shining out and you're like, I'm going to listen to what crazy stuff Guy has to say this week. And it's all part of this beautiful light, this vibe that happens here, you know? And here's the most best part of it all. This is what I love the most is that we do our practice together and we do our lights and we vibe together and then you guys all get in your car and you drive to your families and to your friends and to your homes and to your jobs and you do your light and you create, you attract your own bugs, right? And you light up your own mangrove trees. She's crying, she's making me do it. I wasn't gonna, but she was crying. So I honor each of you as always for being part of this amazing mangrove tree of lights and I know how much you guys take this out of this room, out of this place, and light up your world. Namaste. We just thought we would have all the lightning bugs at the shala in our mangrove tree come for the reading of the quote because you might think that I'm talking and I act like I'm talking to people, but I'm really not. So I want you guys to know that there really are people in the room with me. So here we go. This is from Big Potential by Sean Aker, and um, his son's name is Leo. So I entitled this, A Father's Hope for His Son. Now I realize that I want Leo to be like my father. I don't just want him to be happy, but also to make everyone around him happier. To not only be creative, but to make everyone around him more creative to not only be successful, but to make everyone around him more successful. I don't just want him to be a bright light, I want him to make others shine bright as well.
from all of us here in the Mangrove Tree Pacific Ishtanga. Namaste.